I'm delighted to be with all of you here this morning um, in a room full of women, all eager to learn and share with each other and collectively sort of move us all forward on this journey of fulfillment, which is what I think we're all sort of seeking in our own way. I confess to being a little bit intrigued about the title of this event, pondering the whole one woman idea the influence, the power and capacity for change that one woman has not only in her own life, but in the lives of others around us. I think we can all bring to mind one woman who has influenced our lives. The idea of being fearless, though, that took a little more thought and reflection so I spent a little bit more time thinking about that. And the use of the word summit, I thought that was impressive. I thought, wow, is that word used because we're all at the top of our game here? Or does it mean that we're trying to get to the summit? Or you know, what does that look like? So I thought I was intrigued by the whole notion of just the name of the event. As I look back over my own life, my story, and we all have one, I was able to identify various points in my life where one woman influenced the next steps that I took in my life. For many of us, I would suspect that our mother may have been the first and perhaps most influential woman in our lives. I think it needs to be said that mother-daughter relationships can be complicated. Some are not nurturing. For some of you, your mother may have been absent in your life. But whatever the circumstances, mothers play a key role not only in who we become, but who our children become. Hindsight is 2020, and as I look around, you know, I don't see too many white-haired people. So I'll be the sage, if you don't mind. But as you get older, you have a clearer perspective of the influences that various people had in your life. What I perceive now that I learned from my mother was how to be responsible and hardworking, how to treat others with kindness and respect, how to love and be present in the lives of your children, to help others in need, Keep your house clean, and also keep your children clean, but safe, loved, and protected. Those qualities for me as a young person translated into being a good student, to being kind, to helping, you know, if anybody was in trouble at school at recess, you know, I'd kind of come over there and see what I could do to help them. And school was a bit of a safe place for me, a place where I could be recognized and valued. My parents were not educated people, but as my father once said to me, you need to get an education and get the hell out of here. <laughs> and here was on the Bruce Peninsula, about 20 miles south of Tobermory, Miller Lake, summer ca cottages, provincial parks, all that sort of stuff. But not a lot of opportunity there. I tell the story to my grandsons who have a host of activities and toys and whatever to play with uh, about amusing myself as a child by sitting on a big rock, <laughs> on a big rock alongside of Highway 6 and I would sit out there with my paper and my pen and my markers and whatever and I would count the traffic from the ferry boat <laughs> that came from Tobermory. Now, not only did I count them, I categorized them according to color. <laughs> did they have a boat? Were they pulling a camper? And every afternoon, my mother would say, those damn tourists drive too fast on this two-lane highway. Every day, I just knew that's what was coming not exactly, exactly culturally stimulating. <laughs> there was not money for, or opportunity for the piano lessons that I wanted. 
So after class in a one-room schoolhouse, SS number four, Lindsay, it's, the building is still there, so if you're heading to Tobermory, somebody knows what I'm talking about right back there. <laughs> SS number four, Lindsay, the teacher let me hang around after school so I could plunk away on the piano. She let me clean the blackboards. And when I got a little bit older, in grades seven and eight, she made me, let me put the notes on the blackboard for the younger kids, and sometimes she let me mark their work. That, that teacher was a pivotal person in my young life. Miss Cottle came to school smelling clean and fresh every day. She was wearing starched crinolines under her skirt. Have you ever starched a crinoline? Is, if there's anybody here who doesn't know what a crinoline is, that's your homework to go home tonight and figure it out. But she would come with these starched, you know, crinolines under her skirt. She had a little plastic bouquet of flowers pinned right up at the neck, right up, right up there. And she walked around the room, you could hear it crackling, you know, sometimes. <laughs> and I could see her now looking like that. She was officious, dedicated to her work, kind and helpful to her students. But she was not to be taken lightly. At home, I would frequently cajole my brothers and sisters, get them around the kitchen table to play school. <laughs> and you do not need to ask what my role was. <laughs> I loved giving spelling dictation. So I would walk slowly around the kitchen table. I'd carry that language art speller open like this in my hand and I would give spelling dictation. I would say the word, I would use it in a sentence, I would say the word again, <laughs> and work my way down the list just like Miss Cottle. And when they were finished, I marked the work and made them write their mistakes out three times each. <laughs> I graduated from Stratford Teachers College in 1965, and I taught elementary school for 31 years. Miss Cottle played a pivotal role in that being my career path. And I'm still willing to do spelling dictation if the need arises. <laughs> my maternal grandmother was a person who was active in her church. And in the summers when I was young, I would spend time with her and my grandfather at their farm. That was my summer holidays. At that time, there were missionaries that would come to the church and on Sunday mornings they would tell us different stories about their experiences and adventures in what at that time was pretty much considered the dark continent of Africa. And I was fascinated. I was always intrigued as to what went on there and how did they get there and what did they do there. Part of what the church women did was to collect clothing for the children and grown-ups uh, that would then be sent to Africa to help those people in need. And so sometimes uh, my family struggled to meet the needs of five children, so sometimes we got some of those donations. But those experiences, listening to the missionary stories and helping her with the donation she received, she would answer my questions, she gave me a role to play, that scenario would come full circle in my life, as you will see. A principal I had while I was teaching, a woman, a rarity in those days, told me simply and bluntly that if I wanted to be able to provide for my child's future, I needed to get my university degree, and I did. Because by that time, I was a single parent at the age of 29. It never occurred to me that I was capable of doing that, really. But she saw something in me, and she recognized that I needed some direction and support. Influential in my life, as I was trying to put the pieces back together, uh, was the church. Another woman, another minister, again, not as common then as today, gave me a book to read that changed my life. And I began the process of relearning of healing, of solidifying new lessons learned. Five women, two educators, a minister, and two family members. Each impacted me 
in their own way. One woman. Being fearless. The idea of being fearless may conjure up perhaps different things to different people. It may man itself or ex manifest itself, for example, by going after what you want without regard to the needs or the sensitivities of people around you, whether it's at home or at work. Perhaps fearless to you means going quietly about your business, achieving your goals without fanfare, without noise or drawing attention to yourself. Perhaps being fearless to someone else means marching publicly for the rights of a group needing change, striving for equality, raising awareness, carrying placards, writing letters. What I'm saying is that it can look like different things to different people. I do not know about you, but I did not grow up feeling fearless. I grew up shy, timid, and really I just like to be left alone. And some days I'm still like that. <laughs> just leave me alone. <laughs> Going back for a moment to my family of origin, I told you some of the attributes of, uh, that I learned from my mother that were healthy and positive and desirable, but I also learned other ways of being that were not what we would consider emotionally healthy or empowering. I learned how to acquiesce to the needs and whims of others, to keep my thoughts and opinions to myself, to not rock the boat. I learned what it meant to be fearful. What I said or felt did not seem to be worthy of note or of value. Suffice to say, that did not make for good choices and decisions in choosing a life partner. I, I did not go out into the world as a young woman knowing that I had a voice, that I had a right to use it, and in some cases, indeed, an obligation to use it for the greater good. I did not know or believe that what I thought, felt, or needed was equally as important as another person. It is not by accident that people with addictive personalities migrate to timid, compliant, but responsible and capable women and us to them. That is a story for another day, but I do think in the spirit of being fearless that if we can help others to find their voice, we have an obligation to do that. Just as there are many of you sitting out here today that are competent, capable, decisive women in your workplace or out in public as I was for years, you may be, as I was, quite a different person in the privacy of your own home. You may be living two separate lives. You may have become masterful at the pretense, the denial, and the fantasy. I tell you only despite what you may think, feel, or believe, if you are in a situation with anyone you love that involves addiction, you cannot fix that. And you need to seek out help for yourself and your children. I tell you this because when I became a single parent working full time, trying to rise above my circumstances, trying to get a degree through extension courses at night school and summer school and trying to raise my daughter, trying to learn about how addiction affected me and the role that I played in all that, education gave me empowerment. It gave me financial independence and it gave me a sense of hope. And it was not easy. I would like to say that it was always a straight path forward to health and wholeness, but that's not true. It's hard to unlearn a lifetime of habits that do not serve your best self. But I persevered. Education is an empowering tool. All avenues of learning matter. Many of the greatest lessons I learned, I learned the hard way through personal experience. And once learned, they are not forgotten. And don't worry 
If you don't get it right the first time, that same predicament will keep coming back into your life until you figure it out and get it right. Life is funny that way. Part of my story, part of my story involves the church because as my psyche was being helped and healed, I returned to church and, and the female minister there supported my efforts and she gave me leadership roles in the church, a place where I could do jobs still being responsible, efficient, organized, getting the job done. So my mother, my grandmother, an early childhood teacher, and a woman in a leadership role in my workplace, a sanctuary to nurture the inner me, all set an example for me. Some women, just by being who they were. Others who recognized my struggle and my striving and stood with me in it. I retired from teaching in 1998, that's 20 years ago, last month, so I am very fortunate that I got to retire early, and, and so for those first few days, I did a lot of volunteer work, I did lunch with my friends, and I did some traveling, and in 2003, I moved from Chatham to Stratford. In 2006, there came through the Presbyterian Church in Canada an opportunity to go to Africa, Malawi to be specific, a small landlocked country in Southeast Africa ranked 13 poorest in the world. My good friend and colleague, Carol Hamilton, and I went with some others from across Canada to study and observe the HIV and AIDS projects that the National Church was supporting. We were to bring back information to share, and we did that. But what we did also, four years later, was found a charity called Change Her World whose primary focus is the empowerment of girls and women through education in northern Malawi. Why did we do that? Because we witnessed firsthand in the eyes of girls and women the look of despair and hopelessness, girls who innately knew their future would be the same as their mothers and their mothers before them, the despair of poverty, grueling, backbreaking physical labor in the fields, walking hours in the blazing sun to fetch and carry polluted water that would then sicken their children, sexual violence from men, crippling pregnancies and childbirth, disease, no voice, no value, no hope. The creation of the charity and the work we do in, is in of itself a wonderful, marvelous story that unfortunately there's not time for me to go into this morning. But please come and visit Carol and I at the table because it's a story that we love to share. I will tell you that we currently have 200 girls in school, from nursery school through to post-secondary, and celebrated our first university graduate last September. We have created a Change Her World nursery school, empowered women through goat projects, and so, so much more. This work is my summit. Do you know what the summit looks like for you? What I want to say is this. I'm here today because of a few things. I'm here because Ms. Cottle taught me that education was important, and to get that meant working hard, not giving up, doing your best, and so I was able to be economically independent, educate my daughter, and instill in her the value of education, despite odds being against that. My mother and grandmother instilled in me a sense of responsibility, being respectful and helping others if you could, caring for and protecting children. It just entered my consciousness last year that just as my grandmother's home was the drop-off place for goods going to Africa when I was a child, my basement now houses all the collection campaign for Change the World. Clothing and school supplies and bras and underwear and... Uh, that's not a coincidence, people, by the way. <laughs> that school principal that I mentioned, recognized as a young woman with a child, I needed to up my game, equip myself 
with the best future possible for my daughter that I could. I am instrumental today in giving many girls that same opportunity. The church recognized that I was needing a place of hope, of healing, of acceptance, and a place to contribute and use the gifts and talents that I had. The church plays a central role in the lives of the girls in Malawi. Our work there provides a safety net for these girls. Their needs are met. Some of them refer to Carol and I as their parents because many of them are orphans and have only guardians. What we saw in the eyes of the girls in Malawi was a crying out, a pleading for an opportunity, a chance, some hope to change their lives, their futures, and that of their children. And when you have experienced brokenness yourself, you recognize it in other people. Being fearless is a vital element when moving forward. But it's not what you need to be when faced with the tragedies of a third world country. When an aging, frail Malawian grandmother rolls in the dirt at your feet in gratitude for the equivalent of 10 Canadian dollars you have offered her. Or small boys with mice on a stick, like a kebab, run alongside your vehicle wanting you to buy their wares. What you need in that moment is grace and humility. And the recognition that if you really want to feel empowered to be fearless, then you will do something about the injustice. When you find a cause that is greater than you are, there is a rawness of emotion that moves you forward into the unknown. Knowing and trusting that you will figure it out, whatever that it is, you will get the answers you need and you will get it done, whatever that it may be. A fearful person does not seek out new information or new ways of thinking. A fearful person does not shrink from self-examination, exploring new options, adapting to new ways of interacting in the world, of challenging personal negative thinking or behavior patterns. The fact that we are all here and present in this room to learn, to grow, and to share our stories means that we are all somewhere on that continuum of being fearless. Where we are on the continuum is irrelevant. The fact that we are on it, that is the key. We are all as women today in a critical time and space with obligations, I believe, to reach out to girls and women in need wherever they are, in whatever manner we can. Is there someone you know that has what you have to offer? Start with her. One woman can do that. Thank you. Linda Willis. <laughs>